Okay, so hello everyone. So welcome to our this week practice efficient AI seminar talk. And uh, today we're very glad to have the, the Dr. Uh, Deepak Narayanan to give us this talk. Uh, he is currently the senior uh, senior research scientist in the Microsoft Research. And uh, he got the, the uh, PhD degree from Stanford in computer science uh, department. And uh, he has the broad interest in the distributed computing, large scale machine learning, and so on. And uh, uh, Dr. Narayana has uh, worked out several very uh, uh, good uh, uh, works, in, especially in the large scale distributed deep learning training. and. Uh, now let's welcome him to give us this talk, resource efficient execution of the deep learning computation. Well, yeah, awesome, awesome. Thanks a lot for, for that introduction and thanks for the invitation. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, so yeah, today I'm gonna to be talking about um, some work that I did when I was uh, a PhD student at Stanford. Um, this is joint work with many awesome collaborators um, across Stanford, Microsoft Research, and NVIDIA. So this is preaching to the choir a bit, but deep learning has powered a number of new applications um, and, uh, and has really helped generate state-of-the-art results um, across a number of these new tasks. Um, these include more conventional tasks like machine translation or speech-to-text transcription, uh, but also newer um, uh, tasks like game playing or even uh, 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 new uh, new tasks like like drug discovery um, and and writing code. However, training and inference of modern models is extremely computationally expensive. Uh, this is a graph borrowed from the GPT three paper. Um, that shows the number of computer operations needed to train various natural language processing models. Uh, the largest GPT-3 model requires about eight petaflop per second years of computation. As Moore's law slows down, a wide variety of parallel hardware, such as GPUs, TPUs, multi-core CPUs, and other domain-specific accelerators um, have been introduced to meet this massive computational need. However, each of these hardware architectures have different programming models and show heterogeneous performance behavior on the wide plethora of deep learning models that are commonly used today. Indeed, this heterogeneity is bound to only increase in the coming years. This heterogeneity also complicates traditional deep learning workflows. Typically expensive heterogeneous accelerators are part of a shared resource pool. Schedulers then grant resources to different users. Given dedicated resources, users can then use a existing framework like PyTorch or TensorFlow to execute their training or inference tasks. Right, for, mo right. for modern deep models, computations are iterative, long running, and extremely compute intensive. The goal of most users here is to train and deploy their models with as high performance as possible. However, in practice, users are often forced to make a number of key decisions that critically impact performance. For example, it is not always clear how users should pick resource types for their jobs. Should they use a V100 or A100 GPU, for example, if those are the options available? A sensible policy could be to use the fastest GPU type available, but this can lead to unintended consequences such as jobs being stuck in queues, waiting for resources all the time, if all users go through the same decision-making process. Users do not need to think about this question when using homogeneous devices. And then given resources, users need to decide how to train their model or perform inference. Particularly for training, this process can take days to weeks, meaning users might want to parallelize their computations to get results back in reasonable time frames. Should the user use the same one-size-fits-all parallelization strategy for all models and resource configurations? 
In practice, this is extremely complicated for users, can lead to suboptimal decisions, and consequently can be extremely expensive from both a time and cost perspective. In this talk, I try to make the case for how intelligently reasoning about heterogeneity in terms of models, hardware, and even objectives is, it, is essential in achieving good performance for machine learning training. This can help us obtain throughputs of up to 502 petaflops per second when training a model on thousands of GPUs, or improve average job completion time for a collection of jobs by 3.5x using the exact same set of resources. Consequently, users are able to use their resources much more efficiently. I'm going to discuss how this principle applies in two broad contexts in this talk. First, I will discuss distributed training where we are given a fixed budget of resources and want to train a model as fast as possible. Training a deep neural network model at a high level involves finding weight parameters W that fit a training data set. Training data set typically consists of inputs and associated labels. In this particular case, let's consider an image classification model where we are trying to classify pictures of animals into which particular animal they are. A forward pass through the model generates intermediate activations as well as a prediction. This prediction could be initially incorrect and errors between the prediction and the true label encoded through a loss function are backpropagated through the model in a backward pass generating weight gradients that can then be used to update the model's parameters. The backward pass uses both the weight parameters and intermediate activations as input in order to compute these weight gradients. Optimization is typically performed in iterations and each iteration can be parallelized within an accelerator such as a GPU, but also across accelerators. Since model training is computationally expensive, the option of parallelizing each iteration over many GPUs is often extremely attractive. The most common method of distributed model training is a paradigm called data parallelism, where every device has a full copy of the model. The input data set is sharded and weight gradients are accumulated periodically. Another method of parallel model training is model parallelism, where a single copy of the model is split across multiple devices. This can be performed in a couple of different ways. For example, each layer or operator in the model can be partitioned over multiple devices. This leads to a paradigm that is called tensor model parallelism. Alternatively, layers can be striped across multiple devices and a single batch of samples can be split into smaller micro batches and execution can be pipeline. Each of these approaches has trade-offs along a number of different axes, such as amount of communication. With data parallelism, we need to perform all reductions of weight gradients after every iteration. This can be expensive for large models. Moreover, naive data parallelism can also not be used in isolation for large models that do not fit on in the within the memory capacity of a single accelerator. Data parallelism, however, can be used on smaller model shards in such cases. With tensor model parallelism, layers or operators in the model are split over multiple accelerators. Depending on how these operators are split, different communication patterns are needed. For example, Megatron, a recent paper, proposes a particular splitting strategy for transformer models. Transformer blocks consist of a couple of different matrix multiplications, and when tensor parallelism is used, these matrix multiplications are distributed over multiple GPUs. This whole process can be communication intensive when performed across multi-GPU servers. Finally, with pipeline parallelism, layers in a model are sharded over devices. In other words, each device is responsible for a subset of the layers in the model. A batch of input samples is then split into smaller micro batches and execution is pipelined across these micro batches. Visually, this is what this procedure looks like. 
in this particular example timeline diagram, I'm showing a model split over four devices. In order to perform the backward pass, as we sh as we showed in in a couple of slides ago, uh, we need to ensure that a single input first passes through the four devices in the forward direction, followed by the backward direction. In the top figure, we're denoting input batches with letters. Forward pass is shown in blue, and the backward pass is shown in green. Because of this sequential dependency between uh, different devices, um, at most one device can be used at any point in time. And thus this method suffers from poor utilization and low throughput. Now, in order to improve utilization, we can split this input batch A into four smaller micro batches, A1, A2, A3, and A4, and then pipeline execution across these four micro batches. In order to ensure that the semantics of the weight updates that we perform are identical to what's shown in the top figure, we only step the optimizer and update weight parameters when all micro batches in a batch are completed. So in this particular case, we are only updating, stepping the optimizer and updating weight parameters where my cursor is. Note that every device in this pipeline scheme is still idle for a couple of time units at the start and end of a batch. We call this a pipeline flush as devices wait for inputs to flow through the pipeline and then subsequently get drained out. We can exactly quantify the size of the, this bubble. It's just equal to P minus one forward passes and P minus one backward passes, where P is the number of devices over which we're performing distributed training. In this particular example, P is equal to four, and we can see that the size of the bubble at the start is equal to three forward passes, and the size of the bubble at the end is equal to three backward passes. Note that in steady state, there are um, uh, uh, no idle periods. And, and this will be clearer to see in a, in a timeline diagram where the number of micro batches is larger. Thus, in order to achieve high performance in a variety of different settings, uh, we need to provide heterogeneity-aware distributed training. Each of the approaches I just presented has its own set of trade-offs, which means that a single strategy is not going to dominate all other strategies across all possible models and hardware configurations. For example, uh, the optimal parallel, uh, the optimal distributed training strategy uh, for a model with a large number of weight parameters might be different uh, compared to a model with a smaller number of weight parameters. And similarly, the optimal parallelization strategy for hardware deployment um, with extremely fast interconnects between different devices might be different compared to uh, the parallelization strategy that you might use um, in a hardware deployment with slow interconnects. Thus, in order to route around these various trade-offs, uh, one uh, possible uh, avenue uh, to, to kind of mitigate these various trade-offs is to compose different forms of, of, of parallelism. In, in practice, this is actually not uh, super easy to do. Um, so let's consider a simple example. Uh, let's consider a simplified setting where we're just using tensor and pipeline model parallelism. Here, I'm going to assume that the total number of GPUs at our disposal is n, um, the tensor model parallel size is t, um, and the pipeline model parallel size is p. And since we're only using tensor and pipeline model parallelism, uh, we're going to have this additional constraint that t times p is going to be equal to n. Now we can exactly quantify the pipeline bubble size, which is the fraction of ideal time uh, when uh, devices are idle. Um, which is going to be just equal to p minus one forward and backward passes um, divided by um, m forward and backward passes. m here is the number of micro batches in a batch. Now tf plus tb is going to cancel on both sides. Here tf is the time uh, needed for one micro batch to complete a forward pass. tb is the time needed for one uh, micro batch to finish the backward pass. Uh, these two factors are going to cancel um, and the uh, pipeline bubble size is going to be equal to P minus one 
divided by m. And so now if we substitute p as n divided by t, um, we see that this pipeline bubble size is this expression in terms of n, t, and m. And one observation I want to make here is that as t increases, um, keeping n and m constant, uh, the pipeline bubble size is going to decrease. However, as t increases um, beyond the number of GPUs in a single server, um, the already used communication that is needed for tensor model parallelism uh, now needs to be performed cross server um, and is thus more expensive. And thus we quickly see that uh, increasing the value of this parameter T, which is the tensor model parallel size, uh, produces um, these two effects that are at odds with each other. Um, the pipeline bubble size um, decreasing is good for performance because devices are idle for um, shorter durations of time, um, but also increases the amount of, of expensive cross-device communication that we need to perform, which is bad for performance. And so we can actually see um, these effects um, at play empirically. Um, so here I'm going to show a 162 billion parameter GPT model um, on 64 um, 80 GB A100 GPUs. Um, and, and these are uh, these results were produced on on uh, on servers with eight eight A one hundreds each. Um, so with for with for sixty four GPUs, we're using eight um, servers. Here I'm going to show um, I'm going to vary the pipeline parallel and tensor parallel sizes on the x axis, um, and I'm going to show the achieved throughput per GPU um, on the on the y axis. And a higher number here is, is, is better, um, basically shows better scaling behavior. And so now for two different um, batch sizes um, or two different uh, numbers of micro batches in a single batch, um, we still see the same overall effect. Um, we see that for both large tensor parallel sizes and, and large pipeline parallel sizes, uh, throughput is low, but for different reasons. Um, when the tensor model parallel size is high, we see that throughput is low because of expensive um, cross node communication. Um, and when the pipeline parallel size is, is high, we see um, the performance is bad because of a large pipeline bubble. And consequently, in this particular case, um, we see that P equal to T equal to A is a happy middle ground with highest throughput for both shown uh, batch sizes. And um, the reason why eight uh, uh, works well in this particular case is because uh, we ran experiments on eight GPU servers. Um, and so if we had uh, 16 GPU servers at our disposal, for example, uh, the optimal point uh, could very well be different. The set of trade-offs that we need to navigate um, actually becomes quite a bit larger when we also consider data parallelism. So remember that we were considering a simplified setting here um, where we only had uh, tensor and pipeline model parallelism, uh, but, but things get further complicated when we also need to consider data parallelism. It turns out that the performance um, of, uh, uh, of our distributed training configuration is not only influenced by um, the dimensions of, of parallelism that we use. Um, we can also change the pipeline schedule use. Um, for example, we can assign multiple pipeline stages to each device. Um, so in this top um, figure here, um, we're only um, assigning a single pipeline stage to each device. Um, now this new schedule where we assign multiple stages to each device um, produces yet more trade-offs. Um, so uh, this, schedule that we call an interleaf schedule um, reduces the pipeline bubble size, uh, size um, as can be seen by this black line moving forward in the bottom figure, um, but also leads to an increase in the amount of communication that needs to be performed within the pipeline. The exact mechanics of what's going on here in the bottom figure are not super important for the purpose of this talk, um, but suffice to say that um, the pipeline schedule also affects various um, trade-offs that need to be considered. 
So again, we can empirically um, look at these results. Um, so for a 175 billion parameter model on 96 um, GPUs, um, we see that as we increase um, the batch size or the number of micro batches in, in the batch, um, the performance difference between the default non-interleave schedule and the interleave schedule uh, changes. Uh, and the reason why this um, gap is closing is because um, as we increase the batch size, um, the amount of communication that needs to be performed, um, even in the default schedule, um, uh, increases, um, and that becomes even larger um, when using the interleave schedule. So communication essentially um, becomes more of a bottleneck um, for these larger batch sizes. And if we actually extended this figure to the right, there would be a point where the non-interleave schedule um, becomes better than the interleave schedule. Um, the reason why the interleave schedule is better in these low batch regimes is because um, it has a smaller um, pipeline bubble. So here we see that the optimal choice of pipeline schedule is not only dependent on the model architecture and, and, and the hardware, um, but is also dependent on other hyperparameters that might, one might change during the training process, such as the batch size. Consequently, we observe that many different factors can affect the performance of distributed training at scale, including the degrees of parallelism, uh, the pipeline schedule, um, and even things like the global batch size. Each of these decisions influence the amount of communication, the size of the pipeline bubble, as well as memory footprint. And our supercomputing paper, which won the best student paper award, um, has some more details on how to navigate these different trade-offs. Once we carefully navigate these various performance interactions, uh, we are able to achieve quite strong scaling performance. This is a weak scaling setup where we increase the model size as we increase the number of GPUs. Um, and we observe that at large scales, we are able to efficiently run training iterations for GPT models with up to a trillion parameters using 3000 plus GPUs with extremely graceful uh, scaling. So broad takeaways here are that one parallelization strategy cannot rule all, uh, rule all other strategies across all models and all hardware deployments. Existing parallelization strategies have different trade-offs and these need to be considered carefully in order to obtain good performance. And our end result is that we achieve more cost-effective distributed trading. So now I'm gonna switch tracks a bit um, to scheduling uh, where we try to solve um, this task of, of how to assign resources from a central pool uh, to jobs submitted by various um, users. Um, but again, we're gonna to try to, I'm gonna to try to demonstrate how heterogeneity aware um, scheduling uh, uh, can, can drastically um, improve objective values. But before I do that, uh, maybe I should pause and see if there are any questions. Actually, I have one question. So, yeah. so uh, in your in one of your slides here, uh, the the as I think that the batch size is actually not the two to power of n. So, but it's kind of like the, the uh, like the thirty six and the forty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so why you said batch size with that, that way? Uh, I mean, this is this was not like a, we were just trying to explore the effect of batch size on performance. Um, so we are not recommending any particular batch size in that particular experiment. We just kind of wanted to see the, the relationship of performance with, with the batch size. So we are doing a sweep essentially. Um, but yeah, you could pick powers of two and run the same experiment and that would be okay as well. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, great. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll move forward. So a resource scheduler is trying to, to, to answer this question of how one should allocate resources. Um, 
typically um, the way schedulers work is you have some training jobs, um, often implementing existing frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow. You have some pool of resources, um, and then you try to um, assign resources to different jobs um, while trying to optimize um, a, 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 a pre-specified objective. Um, this could be uh, something like fairness, um, could also be something like cost or, or make span, which is just the total amount of time needed to complete a, a given set of jobs. I want to note here that this is an extremely well-studied problem in computer systems um, in other contexts as well, for example, uh, for uh, big data clusters. However, um, one of the unique things about machine learning is that we are seeing um, heterogeneity become almost uh, pervasive. And this is true uh, for deployments in public clouds. Um, this is also true for um, deployments in private clusters where um, people often um, accumulate um, different types of GPUs um, with time. So anecdotally, uh, my research group at Stanford um, had uh, about three uh, GPUs of three or four different types that were bought um, over a five-year period. The reason why um, heterogeneity uh, makes scheduling more complicated is because models show heterogeneous performance behavior across these different um, hardware architectures. Um, and, and, and so um, we can look at some empirical results here to demonstrate this point. Um, so here I'm showing normalized throughput with respect to an older K80 GPU um, on a V100 GPU for different model architectures. And we see that the speed ups um, uh, vary quite a bit. For example, we see that our transformer model experiences only a 3.3x speed up when moving um, from a K80 to a V100 GPU. Um, however, ResNet 50 job sees a much larger speed up of 9.6x. Now, if giving each of these jobs um, equal time on a V100 K80 GPU through a simple round robin schedule uh, leads to a much worse outcome for the ResNet 50 job, um, since the ResNet 50 job uh, sees of such a, uh, a low throughput um, on the K80 GPU. On the other hand, a transformer model is not as adversely affected um, by uh, having to run some training iterations on the KAT GPU. Thus, we see that disregarding heterogeneity can lead to suboptimal allocations, and in this work, we try to do better. Our goal here is to provide heterogeneity-aware scheduling across a range of different objectives. So these could include uh, objectives specified over just a single job, such as minimizing uh, the cost of running that job or maximizing its throughput. Um, and such decisions can usually be made fairly easily by just looking um, at the raw throughputs that the job observes on the different accelerator types. Objectives can also be specified over multiple jobs. Um, so, and, and this, as one might imagine, uh, becomes a lot more complicated um, because one needs to reason through um, uh, capacity constraints, um, but also the effect of each job's um, assigned allocation on the end objective, such as fairness that, that one wants to optimize. One thing I want to note here is that uh, we are not the first um, cluster scheduler that was explicitly designed for deep learning. However, most um, existing schedulers like Gandiva, Themis, or Tiresias um, do not consider uh, performance heterogeneity. Um, Allox and Gandiva Fair are two um, schedulers that do consider performance heterogeneity, um, but only support specific objectives and would need complete system redesigns in order to support other objectives as well. So in order to address these challenges, we designed Gavel, which is a new heterogeneity aware preemption based scheduler um, that addresses these issues in a two-step process. So Gavel supports both on-premise and cloud deployments um, and generalizes existing scheduling policies 
by expressing them as optimization problems or over allocations. Java uses an abstraction we call um, effective throughput um, in order to allow optimization problems to incorporate accelerator and workload heterogeneity. Gavel then uses a policy agnostic ground based scheduling mechanism in order to realize allocations that have been optimized for various objectives. Um, and, and this ground based scheduling mechanism ensures that jobs um, actually receive the optimal allocation returned by the various policies. And using this, this two stage process, Gavel is able to improve objectives such as average job completion time by as much as 3.5x. So to recap, we, we want to make a large number of scheduling policies heterogeneity aware. Um, these include simpler policies such as um, FIFO or shortest job first, um, but also include more complicated um, fairness policies such as those proposed in recent work, um, and even hierarchical policies where we could um, combine a fairness as a top level policy and, and first in first out as a lower level policies. Um, and yeah. So our main insight in Gavel is that objectives of, in these, of these common policies uh, can be expressed as a function of each job's observed throughput. For example, in the shortage job first policy, the duration of a job is just the ratio of the number of training iterations that need to be run uh, divided by the throughput of the job. Um, similarly, the cost of a job is just the duration times the per hour cost of, of uh, uh, the, 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 really the training resources that are being used. Um, and similarly, the speed up of a job is just the ratio of the jobs as a throughput divided by uh, the reference throughput. However, in a heterogeneous setting, we need to take into account the fact that um, jobs can see unequal throughput reductions on heterogeneous resources. Um, and we also want to support the case where jobs are moved between um, various resources um, over the course of its duration. Uh, and so the natural question to ask is, in that new setting, how should we think about throughput? And so our answer to that question is to represent um, allocations as time fractions. Um, so in, 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 for the rest of this talk, I'm going to use a letter X um, to represent an allocation. Um, and it's just going to signify the fraction of time that each job spends on different accelerator types. So we can represent um, uh, allocations as uh, 2D matrices. Um, where each row corresponds to the particular job's um, allocation um, and each column uh, corresponds to the particular resource type. In this particular example, um, the allocation is saying that job zero should receive 60% of time on a V100 GPU and 40% of time on a P100 GPU, while job one should spend 20% of time on a V100 GPU and 60% of time on a P100 GPU. Uh, one thing I want to note here is that allocations um, are meant to um, be valid only for short time horizons um, and so and would be recomputed when a new job arrives or an old job uh, completes. The optimal value of this allocation is dependent on the objective and the policy we are trying to optimize for. And so the optimal allocation for this set of three jobs um, would be different for a fairness policy compared to a minimized next plan policy. The natural next question to ask is how do these allocations as I've described them um, affect the throughput that each jobs observe? It turns out that there's actually a very simple mathematical relationship. Um, so again, I'm considering that same allocation uh, from the previous slide. Um, and let's also make this assumption that uh, the job zero um, has a throughput of 100 iterations per second on the V100 GPU and 40 iterations per second on the P100 GPU. Now, if job zero spends 60% of its time on the V100 and 40% of its time on the P100, 
then is throughput in net if this allocation is realized uh, ideally um, would be 60% times 100 plus 40% times 40, which works out to 76 iterations per second. Thus, we see that by time averaging the individual throughputs that jobs observe on different resource types, um, we get the effective throughput of running jobs on that resource mix according to the specified allocation. Mathematically, this effective throughput is just going to be the dot product of the raw throughput matrix um, and the allocation uh, matrix. Um, and, and, and we see that effective throughput can capture the effect of moving a job from a faster um, resource type to a much slower resource type by just explicitly incorporating this matrix of raw throughput. So now equipped with this notion of an allocation and this notion of, of, of raw throughput and effective throughput, um, we can see how we can convert existing policies um, into um, heterogeneity aware versions. So let's consider a least certain uh, service policy where we're trying to equalize um, the total compute time that each job receives. If you were to ignore um, heterogeneous performance completely, um, the homogeneous version of this policy would just um, involve uh, computing a maximum allocation um, uh, over the allocation itself. Um, and so we have some constraints here to ensure that the allocation is going to be valid. Now the, heterogene uh, the heterogeneity aware version of this policy is again going to compute some maximum allocation, but instead of the uh, computing maximum of the allocation itself, um, we're going to compute um, a maximum um, allocation of the normalized effective throughput. And the reason why we use this normalization term in the denominator here is to ensure that we can actually compare um, throughputs across different jobs. Um, if we didn't have this normalizing throughput, um, we, we could compute unfair allocations because, for example, a resident 50 job might be able to train um, on the order of hundreds of iterations a second, while a language model, which might be more computationally expensive, might only be able to run on the order of um, tens of iterations per second, for example. And we observe that um, we can convert policies for the objectives uh, to become heterogeneity aware um, versions of themselves uh, similarly. So we ran multiple experiments on a large simulated cluster with 108 GPUs of different types in order to actually verify that these heterogeneity aware policies actually um, did something. Um, here we're, I'm going to show one such experiment uh, for uh, with the same maximum fairness policy from the previous slide. Uh, but our paper um, that appeared at OSTI in 2020 um, has um, experiments that show that gavel is useful uh, for other policies as well. To illustrate how gavel can support higher input job loads on the same set of resources, um, I'm going to show results with, uh, with multiple traces. Um, and each trace here is going to correspond to a different Poisson arrival rate. Um, so, so the way to, to read this graph is on the x-axis, I'm varying the average input job rate um, by changing the uh, Poisson arrival rate um, of, 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 of the trace that I'm using. Um, and on the y-axis, I'm showing the average job completion time. Uh, so this is a common metric that people use um, for fairness policies, um, especially for cluster schedulers, um, and a lower number is better. So there are a couple of interesting um, results here. Um, the first is that on the same set of resources, um, Gavel's two heterogeneity aware policies, which are the orange and the green line, uh, are able to sustain much higher input job rate um, and, the, and the reasons for this is because Gavel's heterogeneity aware policies are able to be more strategic about deciding to give what type of resources to different uh, jobs. We also see for a given um, job rate, Gavel is able to uh, 
produce a much better average job completion time. In this particular case, uh, 3.5x lower average job completion time. And also, if you were to look at um, the behavior in the tail of the, the distribution for this particular um, average input job rate, we see a much shorter um, tail as well. Uh, Gavel is able to compute allocations uh, fairly efficiently. Um, so, so here um, I'm showing the scaling properties for Gavel's heterogeneity aware policies. Um, note that um, this particular least attained service policy um, is implemented as a linear program. Um, and we observe that we can solve these allocations quite efficiently um, up to 2048 jobs. Um, um, and it turns out that we can optimize this even further. Um, and we wrote a, pa a paper on uh, the technique that we use to accelerate this process called POP um, that appeared at SOSP um, last year. So broad takeaways here, um, performance heterogeneity makes resource allocation um, in a macro sense much harder. Um, and differing choice to users can lead to bad outcomes, such as all users choosing the same fastest resource site, increasing queuing delay. Instead, we show that we can formulate policies as optimization problems and use effective throughput in order to incorporate performance heterogeneity, um, thus helping us improve objectives by up to 3.5x. And so in, in this talk, um, I tried to emphasize or illustrate that careful automated scheduling of computation um, at both macro and micro levels um, can drastically increase training throughput as well as other objectives. Um, and I showed this in uh, for two different contexts of distributed training as well as scheduling. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Deepak. So very informative talk. And uh, any questions from the audience? So actually, I have several questions, but I would like the audience to ask first. Uh, hello, uh, Deepak. Uh, I have a question. Uh, first, uh, can you go back to your uh, slide 33? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, so for the, if you want to optimize the, uh, let's say the, uh, completion time and for the first item. Uh, so here it's like the training iteration. It's kind of uh, you assume the training iteration is known, right? Beforehand. Yeah. So so we need some estimate, right? So 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 any training job is going to have some pre-configured number of training iterations that it runs for. Um, so that's what we would use in this particular case. But of course, users can terminate training like earlier, for example, if the model is really high, uh, it, it is already achieving high accuracy on the validation data set, or if, uh, or in the other extreme as well, right, where the model is not performing well. Um, and so, yeah, in, in those particular cases, um, our optimization problem initially um, uh, kind of solves for the wrong duration, right? Like it, it thought that the job was going to run for much longer. Um, but, but note that we recompute allocations um, whenever a new job arrives or an old job completes. Um, and so um, basically once that job completes and is pulled out of the cluster, we would recompute uh, allocations. Um, but yeah, you're right that um, if the estimate that you give us is far off from, from, what, from the number of iterations that the job actually runs for, um, then the allocation quality is 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 affected. Um, but yeah. Okay. Second. Um. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Second question is about your evaluation. In your evaluation, there is a baseline called a least attended service, right? Yeah. So yeah. For the, for that one, uh, I'm wondering for the least attended service, how to define the amount of service? Is it just the wall wall clock time, or it's the wall clock time, uh, times the uh, resources re required. Yeah. This is the number of GPU. Really, really good question. It's it's the second. It's like wall clock time times the number of, of resources. 
Yes. Okay, I see. Um, the last question I have is, um, so uh, for solving this optimization problem, what's the mm -hmm. time cost? Yeah, so that's what this graph was trying to show, right? So these, this is the cost of, of solving the optimization problem. Um, I didn't really talk about what gavel with SS is. So this is gavel with space sharing. Um, space sharing is an optional optimization that allows us to determine what jobs to co-locate on different, on different hardware resources. Um, the reason why it's more expensive to compute is because um, the allocation, the, the linear program is considering um, all pairs of jobs um, on, on different resource types. And so the, the variables, number of variables grows quadratically um, with the number of jobs. Um, but yeah, even with, with space sharing, which is more computationally expensive, um, for this more simple fairness policy, um, you can compute the allocations for 10, 24 jobs in about 500 seconds, which is, which is not great. Um, but yeah, like if you take this idea we had from our SOSP paper last year, um, we could drive those times to be much lower. Like we could decrease the computation times by 10 X or, or more um, okay. in, in certain settings. Okay. So, so yeah. You are using the Groovy server? Yeah, so in this particular case, we're using CVX5. Um, okay. and I think we use uh, the SCS solver. Um, okay. but, but yeah, you could you could also use um, Jirobi. The okay. performance results might be slightly different. But, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Other questions from the audience? So if no question from the audience, maybe I can ask some questions. Yeah. Uh, so, so first, uh, also for the slide 32, so will you yeah. use throughput to... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, here, here, like for the drop speed up, so here it, it is involved with the reference throughput. And yeah. uh, so that means that you, when you like to use the, like the standalone GPU and then to test its throughput, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you could <laughs> take the, the jobs A100 throughput or something, and that would be uh, a, a constant, right? It's, 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 uh, yeah, it's a, it's a constant. So that would be the, the denominator. Yeah. So here, because we know that for the real runtime measurement, so the, the, the through the, your measure the throughput actually it is also depends on there's many other factors like the how many like the workloads we are running on the device and so on so here you assume that so uh, for when we measure the reference throughput and the actual throughput to the, like the number of jobs we run that they're, they're the same right yeah exactly so so we're not uh worrying too much about interference um we're saying that um uh in the, in the setting where you're not co-locating jobs under the same GPU, um, the effect of interference is low. Uh, I mean, you could have multiple jobs running on the same server, but we argue that that's low. Um, if you are co-locating multiple jobs under the same GPU, then we explicitly uh, try to uh, kind of account for interference there. Um, so basically we, um, the, the allocation and the raw throughput explicitly considers like this pair of, of, of jobs is running on the GPU on a, a, at this particular point in time. And so that would be a specific measurement, right? Like ResNet 50 and transformer model on V100 GPU, that's one measurement. ResNet 50 with, I don't know, like some other type of model on V100 GPU, that's another measurement. And so if we do have kind of co-location, we try to be very explicit about about modeling that um yeah mm, but how about the communication cost here because yeah. uh, we use the standalone gpus as there's no communication cost among the yeah so 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 if you want to throw distributed jobs into the mix then uh the profiling that you do would need to be distributed as well uh, oh, okay i see yeah 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 uh, and, and by the way i have another more general question so yeah. uh, uh, so I guess uh, for your method, some your assumptions that so once we like to uh, determine the policy and then perform the scheduling and then for for each job, so the the number of the different type of the 
devices they will be fixed, right? So I, for example, I I assign like the eighteen V one hundred for this draw. I assign like yeah, the, yeah, the sixteen yeah. V one hundred yeah. for another. Yeah. But whether it is it it can be like the potential to provide more kind of the dynamic scheduling. Yeah. Okay. So even for the same job, we can maybe dynamically adjust the, the available devices to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good question. Yeah. So we don't support elastic training. We assume that the number of GPUs you request is static, um, and we don't we don't change that. I think supporting elastic training is an interesting extension. Um, one thing you need to be cognizant of is um, if you change the, 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 the number of GPUs being used, um, you could either, if you don't, if you change the batch size as well, then you're changing the semantics of the computation. Um, and so that becomes a little harder to reason through. Um, but yeah, like if you change the number of GPUs used and keep the number, keep the batch size the same, then that's that's fine. That's kind of a semantics preserving. Uh, uh, that's yeah, that that, that that's okay. Uh, there is a paper from I think OSDI last year called Polux from CMU that does look at um, elastic um, scheduling. But yeah, you're right that we didn't consider elastic scheduling in the context of of this work. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, another follow up question that so, so right now, so this framework is targets the, the device of the, the different type of GPU. So, mm -hmm. so how about the potential extension to like the, the more heterogeneous, like the CPU plus GPU, or even like the some of the more specific accelerator, like the, the like the, the those the, the Cerebras accelerator and so yeah, on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, so what I talked about in this talk is, is pretty agnostic to the, the type of accelerator. Um, we just use GPUs because the, they were most readily available to us, both in our internal cluster and also in the cloud. But yeah, you could definitely throw things like TPUs into the mix and um, use the same ideas. Um, of course, you need some way of uh, being able to run um, training iterations on all of these different um, accelerators, um, but I, but for example, PyTorch does have TPU support now, so you could, and of course it has CPU support, right? So, so you could feasibly train across CPUs, TPUs, and GPUs um, using the same code, um, which mm. is kind of a underlying assumption here um, that I guess I I kind of didn't talk about explicitly, but yeah. Okay. And I think another related uh, direction is that so, so how about the adaption of this framework to like to more like right now popular federal learning if the device is not so powerful GPU but more kind of the edge device and the more heterogeneous. Yeah. Do you vision some like the, the unique opportunities and challenges in that paradigm? Yeah, I think the, the, the main challenge in that paradigm is um, the fact that uh, workers can drop in and out of the computation, right? Um, yeah. They're, they're not, yeah, like a, like, a, like a user can connect with their laptop, but then disconnect after 30 minutes or something. So you kind of need to be resilient to, to workers dropping in and out, which is very different from like the, the data center setting where um, you have... Uh, where failures are perhaps infrequent and uh, the, the GPUs are all available at any point in time. So I think that's the, the main novel challenge that I see in trying to like apply something like this to the federated learning um, setup. Um, but I think there are a number of unique challenges that even just dropping in and out um, brings about right like i think there are statistical challenges but there are also um systems challenges as well uh that that i think make that problem quite unique compared to the one we discussed today uh, and uh, actually that that means that so we need to have kind of some more robust like the, the scheduling and more dynamic scheduling policy to handle that issue yeah, 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 I, I think so. I think the other problem is that um, 
you might not have like very high bandwidth communication channels between these different weak workers. Um, so yeah, so I think it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, like I think there are differences in that setting compared to this setting, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and, and uh, one last one last question from from my side. Is that, yeah. So, how about the um, the adaptation of this work? Like we know that this is more target for this distributed training and mm -hmm. distributed training. So whether it can be like to extend it to like the decentralized training. And is there any new? Training? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess decentralized training is similar in some ways to, to federated learning, right? Um, uh, I, I guess, what, what do you mean by, by decentralized training? Uh, yes, for the federal learning, we can do like in a distributed and the centralized way or purely decentralized way. So here, I don't specifically may, uh, indicate that for the federal learning, but like if, even for the like for the data center, we can also do the decentralized. Training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that I I need to think about a bit more. I don't think I have a terribly satisfying answer. It seems like people people at least today don't really do decentralized um, training. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe there are some advantages that that I I guess especially from from like a privacy perspective, maybe decentralized is, is better, but I haven't really thought about what the system challenges are of, of trying to do decentralized training. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Hi, hi uh, Deepak, I have one more question about your yeah. framework. Yeah. Uh, so specifically, so for this framework, is it suitable for a case when the cluster is overloaded, which means there are many jobs waiting in the queue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can this uh, framework handle such case? Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. So, so um, like the, this particular example allocation is in the um, our, like not oversubscribed case, um, where essentially if you summed all of the numbers in a row, you get one. Um, mm -hmm. which means that the, each job is um, essentially spending time on some GPU at any point in time. Um, but you could imagine a case where we add another row here. Um, and then uh, maybe because there are only three GPUs and four jobs, um, each row is no longer going to sum to one. Right? So like maybe row one sums up to 0.8. Um, and what that means is that the job is spending 20% of its time idle. Um, and 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 so that oversubscribed case is naturally handled in the in the same framework with the same allocation format and so on, and we don't have to do anything kind of specific to to handle that that particular setting. Oh, so for that case, it's kind of the job is running for some time and then preempted, right? Yeah, it's preempted, and mm -hmm. and you store the, the 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 checkpoint for that job somewhere, okay. right? Um, on a mm -hmm. maybe distributed file system. And then when you restart the job, then you you start from that checkpoint. But I mean, we're we're supporting preemption anyway, right? Like like here, if the job is running on the V100 GPU for sixty percent of its time, then we want to move it to the P100 GPU so that it you kind of respect its its actual its optimal allocation, right? Okay. So if we're doing preemption even to move jobs between different types of, of GPUs. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Good question. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, so if if no more questions, so let's thank our speaker deeper again, and uh, thank you so much for giving us this very wonderful talk, and also thank all the audience to attend our uh, this week seminar, and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Deepak. Thank you. See you. Have a wonderful day. Yeah. Bye. You too. See you. Bye. Mm-hmm.